I'll give Jesus some praise. Thank you, Jesus. Just a little bit more. Give him some more. Yeah. Yeah. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, God. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, guys. Tonight's your night, Shay. Tonight's your night. Thank you, Lord. How's everybody doing? You guys can be seated. You've been standing for a while. I want to thank you guys for being here on a Wednesday night. Pastor Donnie and Laura are in Washington, D.C. and join one another for their anniversary. They've been married 315 years, and they were due for, no, it's 30, I think 35 years. Is that right? 31. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I'm bad at math. No, it's good. Pastor is going to watch this and be like, dang, man. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. You guys doing good? Yes. Has the Lord been good to you this week? Amen. Come on, isn't he always good? He's so good. You know, I used to care what you think, but I don't anymore. That's right. <laughs> That's right. We love you. I love you too. Tonight, I want to talk to you about knowing your season. Will you say that with me? Say, knowing my season. And I've, I've tried to preach this message one other time before, but the Lord didn't allow me to. And uh, I stopped and preached something else. And early this morning, the Lord told me to preach this sermon. So I've, I've been working on this sermon. This has been a, I haven't worked on it consistently for six months, but I had something typed up about it, a word that had, the Lord had dropped in my heart about six months ago. And I have a lot of words like that that I just put back. Sometimes the Lord, his, his word is like a seed and it's going to go into your heart. And as you continue to fellowship and continue to read your word and, and be intimate with Jesus through the word, that water of the word is going to come and begin to spring stuff up in your heart. Yeah. And it's so just important to journal, write things down, write what the Lord is speaking to you about write it down put it somewhere and it's really amazing to go back and just revisit what the lord was speaking to you three months ago six months ago two weeks ago and there's a lot of there's been often times in my life where i'll go back and just read through some stuff that i just wrote down with that was just with me and jesus and what the lord does almost always what he does always i'll be bold enough to say it like that the word that the season that you're going to live in next the lord has given you a word already in this season for the next season you're about to walk into. He's never going to let you walk into a season without a word from him. He never will. And so if you have documented, you've spent time with him and journaled, you, I, I would guarantee it. And listening to the Lord, you would ha already have the word that you needed for the season you're in right now. And if you don't do that, start now. Start tonight. Go home. Just worship Jesus as he speaks to you. Maybe it's just a scripture. Maybe it's just a word. Just write it down. That's your word. Nobody can take that word from you. That's your word from the Lord. Amen. And so tonight I want to talk to you about knowing your season. And I'm not and I'm not being dramatic. This is probably one of the most um, empowering messages I could preach to you. But I'm not even going to preach it. I'm just going to talk. I'm going to keep my heart clear, mind clear. And I'm just going to preach what the Lord's given in my spirit for you. Because if you can catch what I'm saying, it's either going to be really confusing and it'll be like a parable and you just get a little stuff out of it. Or we'll get it together and it'll be drove home and it'll be clear. I don't know what's what will happen, but we'll roll with it. And so how many of you know life is full of seasons? Yes. Life is full of seasons. A lot of times we hear Christians say, I'm in this season, I'm in that season, I'm in this season, I'm in that season. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But the word, the Hebrew word um, for, for season is just et, like et. I don't know if I'm even saying it right, but it just means a particular time. It's a particular time and it's used in a lot of ways. Um, but but the, the Webster's Dictionary definition of season is, is very good. It's a time characterized by a particular circumstance or feature. So a season is a time that is characterized by a particular circumstance. A season is a circumstance that you may be walking through. A season may be a period of your life for, for young moms that have a baby stuck to their hip. That's a season. And just like the season ends, that little baby that's going to go on your hip will be running around your feet one day and then getting into everything. And that's, 
that's another season you're stepping into. And, and that so many times we go through seasons, seasons in your marriages, seasons in your finances, seasons in your walk with the Lord. Um, there's natural seasons. And we say that word a lot. So it's just a time characterized by a particular circumstance or feature. Listen, and knowing what season you're in, if you don't know what season you're in right now, you're automatically in trouble. You must know what season you're in spiritually. Knowing your season is the most empowering thing you can do in your life. Let me explain. Listen to me. If you don't get anything, get this. Every season that you're in in your life has an assignment. Every season has an assignment. The Lord never just puts you in a season and you're walking through something for no reason at all. Every time, every situation that you're living in, every season you're walking through, the Lord wants to give you an assignment to accomplish in that season. The Lord is never not doing something. He's always doing something. And, the, and what will empower you is to be with God through the word of God and relationship with God to understand the assignment you got for this season of your life. What is he wanting you to do? What is he wanting you to say? What is he wanting to form and build in you? What stronghold have you believed that's bad doctrine that was maybe religious teaching or maybe it was something a lie in your mind? Maybe you're going to go through a season of deconstructing that stronghold and building truth up in your mind. That's There's a, there's a time to destroy things in your mind that don't belong there and a time to build up there are seasons like that but if you don't know your season you're not going to know what to focus on you must know your season every season has a meaning there's there's nothing that you walk through that that the lord will just use as meaningless there the lord wastes nothing the Lord wastes no experience. The Lord wastes no circumstance. Either he redeems it and purifies it and uses it as your testimony and puts it as a weapon in your hand to destroy the lies of the enemy if you walk through something tragic. The, the Lord is all about multiplication. And that's what he wants to do in our lives. But if you don't know your season, you're not going to give him anything to multiply. And that's not just so we can have big barns and full vats. That's so you can actually live in life in abundance and be a blessing to people who need help. Absolutely. The Lord, I'm telling you, the Lord wants to so do something in his people because the, the world wants nothing to do with Christians that live up and down. Good one minute, bad the next. Good one minute, bad the next. The world wants nothing to do with Christians that hate each other's spouses, that are, how, that are divided. That live in sex that, that are not like in uh, that sounded horrible. That live like in, in groups. What are they called? Uh, start, starts with the C. Clicks. Clicks. That's the word I was trying to say. <laughs> the world wants nothing to do with people like that. But if we know our season, I'm telling you. If you know your season, you can be empowered in what the Lord's teaching you to do. See, you know, a lot of people, this happens a lot. A lot of people miss out on what God wants to do in them and through them because they think the season that they're in is meaningless. The Lord can't use me in this season. I can't do nothing this season. I have a baby stuck in my hip. I can't do nothing this season. I'm just, I'm just back here washing toilets. I can't do nothing in this season. This is what I, this so I just work my job. I can't do anything in this season. This is what I'm doing now. That's, that is a lie from the enemy to keep you on the sidelines and watch people play the game. And then you get envious of the players in the game because you can't play like them. You don't feel like you're good enough to do what they're doing. And the enemy sidelines you when I'm telling you cleaning the toilet matters. That's what the enemy does. He wants to tell you that the season you're in is meaningless. This isn't, it's not going to, you're, you, you're, you're ineffective. It's a lie to disengage you from, from walking in your assignment for that season. See, what has God called you to do in this moment, right now in your life? What's he wants you to do in this time for his name right now? And you have to hear that from God. If I could tell you, you would all have jobs. I'd put you all to work, man. I promise. Go to John chapter 10. You have to only hear that from God. Get on your face, learn your place, run your race. Get on your face before the Lord. Learn your place in the Lord. And run your race. 
John chapter 10. Let's read verses 17. This is why it is so important to understand your assignment. This verse right here. I'm going to read these couple verses. John 10 verse 17. Say amen when you're there. Does everybody hear? If you don't bring your Bible, you need to bring it. It's, it's cheating to use your phone. Bring it. Noah Lou, I know you have a Bible. <laughs> you can't hide. John chapter 10, verse 17 says, Therefore, this is Jesus, therefore my Father loves me because I lay down my life that I may take it again. Just hold your finger right there. I'm tired of hearing pro-choice people saying, If God killed his son, I can kill mine. Nobody killed Jesus. Jesus laid his life down. None of those 63 million babies chose to die. Jesus gave his life. Theirs was taken. Verse 18 says, no one takes it from me. Listen to what he says. But I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it again, period. And you have to catch this sentence. And he says, this commandment I have received from my father. What's Jesus saying? This is real simple. If he commands you to do it, he gives you the power to fulfill it. It is cruel to command somebody to do something they can't fulfill. So when, when Jesus says, even if you commit idolatry with her in your heart, that's still committing idolatry. So if he's given us a command not to do it, what's he supplying? The power to not do it. You never have an excuse, no longer because of Jesus, to live a roller coaster Christian life. Now that Jesus has come, he had his skin removed off his body and the nails drove it into his hands and his feet, went into the grave, conquered sin, death, and hell. Now he's arose, sitting on the right hand of the throne of power of majesty, and we're seated with him, and we still have bad days. There is no excuse for you to live like this. The world wants nothing to do with that. You are a bad witness. When he gives us a commandment, he gives us a grace to fulfill what he has commanded us to do. And so if you know your season and you know your assignment, what do you have? The power to fulfill it. See how that works? And this is why it's so important. Because here's the tactic of the enemy. This is what he does. This is where the Lord has me now in this place with this assignment. And I don't really like it, Lord. I wish I was over there in this place, over here, right here in this assignment. And all of a sudden, like, you've stepped out of God's divine power, God's divine grace for you to live in the place that he called you to. And you're trying to do something else. And this is where burnout happens. This is where you get tired. This is where you get run down. This is where you begin to... Compare yourself to other people that's in the place you want to be in. <laughs> it's what happens. Are you guys okay? Yes. Am I just crazy? If I'm missing it, I'm telling you, I'll go home. It don't bother me any. <laughs> it really don't. Okay. This is, that's the tactic of the enemy. See, the devil wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. We know the scripture. It's, it's right there, actually. See, but first he must displace you. That means he must move you from the place that you're in. So he wants to steal from you, kill you, and destroy you. But first he must displace you. Yes. And this is what the tactic of the enemy does. Before the enemy had dominion over Adam and Eve, he had to get them out of the garden. Yes. Do you understand that Adam named the serpent? And so if Adam named the serpent, what does that mean Adam had over the serpent? Authority. If something has a name on you, it has authority over you. Whatever you name, you give power and authority to. And so I'm not naming myself anxiety. I'm naming myself peace. I'm not naming myself depression. I'm naming myself joy. I'm not naming myself diabetes and sick. I'm naming myself healed. Because all of a sudden we give it a name and a title and immediately that gives it authority. And see, the enemy had no authority over Adam and Eve in the garden. In the garden, they had all dominion. So what was his tactic? It was to get them out of the garden. And you know what really the ultimate tactic was? It was to stop them from their assignment. Do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was their assignment. What did the enemy come for? Their assignment. Yes. Yes. 
Because he knew if he can, if he can separate, them, separate them from their assignment, he's separating them from the divine flow of grace and power. You see the importance of your season. And it's just what the enemy wants to do because in Christ Jesus, I'm the devil's master. Outside of Christ Jesus, the devil's my master. My son said it last night. He said, the devil don't tell me what to do. I tell the devil what to do. But that's only in Christ Jesus. As soon as by faith, and then you're there by faith. You're there because you believe. If you want to know what moves God, I'm telling you it's faith and nothing else but faith. Because without faith, it is impossible to please God. So what does that also tell us? What pleases God? And so by faith, you're in Christ Jesus, seated with him in heavenly places. By faith, you're, you're in him. If any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have been made new. So in Christ Jesus, you're new. You have authority. You can go on and on through your Bible. There's actually only two people groups in the New Testament. It is those in Christ Jesus and those that are not. Read it. That's, that's the revelation in Christ Jesus. That's how the Bible refers to us now. It doesn't even call us Christians. It calls us in Christ Jesus or saints. Saints in Christ Jesus. <laughs> and so if the, what's the enemy want, you, want to get you out of? You see how simple that is? Because then he has authority over you. He has no authority over you. You're in Christ Jesus. You guys okay? Yeah. Listen, he, he prepares you for seasons of your life. The Lord does. He prepares you for seasons of your life. I'm going to get to a scripture, and you have to hold on to the scripture I'm giving you. It's in Psalms chapter 1, if you want to flip there now. Because it tells us how to live like this. It tells us the foundation. And he prepares you for, for every season of your life. And the season that you are in now is going to prepare you for the season you're about to face. Yes. Psalms chapter 1. It's amazing. It's how he begins the book of Psalms. Listen, so I've been talking to you about your season and your assignment. And there's... And how you know which one you're in is just by spending time with the Lord. Yes. There's been seasons in my life where I was in ministry and I stepped down and I wasn't doing ministry. And it was a hard season of my life. I was in an identity crisis and I had to learn who I was apart from ministry. Yes. I learned about the person in a secret place that was far better than a pulpit <laughs> and a platform. Yes. And so, but the Lord... What the Lord does in seasons is he just, he grooms you. He refines you. Seasons don't define you. They refine you. Jesus defines you. And so you're, all, we have one general purpose. Why you're alive, why you're a Christian is to manifest Jesus. That's why you're a Christian. That's what truly a disciple does is manifest Jesus. Not just imitate. Anybody can imitate. A mockingbird can imitate what you say. But it only takes somebody's heart who's truly transformed to manifest Jesus. Yes. And so you can imitate externally, but you can't manifest unless he's, he's formed you internally. Does that make sense? Yes. And that's our purpose, is to be like him. That's what Jesus restored. That's what Adam and Eve lost when they ate the fruit in the garden. They lost made in his image. Then the enemy, sin and death took authority over them. Jesus comes as the second Adam to create a whole people group from himself that was like him. Come on, you have to catch stuff like this. That's why Jesus was in the tomb for three days. You know what happened on the third day of creation? That's when God created each seed that reproduces after its own kind. Jesus just wasn't in the tomb for three days to be in the tomb for three days. He didn't wake up, yawn, and decide to finally get out of the tomb. He was, getting, he was creating for himself a people like him. To manifest who he is. So that's your purpose. And your assignment is not your purpose. You have to get that. Because if that's who you are and you know that's the rock bed of your foundation, you're always going to run well no matter what season you're in. <coughs> then your assignment, what you do for the Lord, won't define you when he's defined you, who he is in you and through you, and the price that he's paid for your life because you're valuable and precious. Come on, that's so good. 
And all of a sudden you'll find, your, you'll find yourself identifying with a season and with an assignment and your life will go like this. Yes. Listen, if I were to tell you to write anything down tonight, I'll tell you to write this. Seasons change, but our fruit remains. That's right. yeah. Yeah. And you have no excuse. And the fact that we acknowledge seasons, it doesn't give you an excuse to not bear fruit in one season and then bear fruit the next. That's horrible. That is not right. It's less than the truth. And that's just proof you're finding yourself in a season and in an assignment and not in the purpose of being with the person. Seasons change, but our fruit remains. I got you, Gigi. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. See, I'm going to I'm gonna try to bring this out. See, people come to me all the time and they're like, brother, I want to stop sinning. And I'm like, praise God. <laughs> Yay, that's great. And they're like, but I don't know how to. And I'm like, yeah, that's usually people's problem. <laughs> but I want to stop sinning. Come on, how many of you do that? I mean, how many of you know somebody? You don't have to say it's you or your spouse. It's, how many of you know somebody that has a true, sincere heart that wants to be better, but they can't find in themselves to be better? Do you want to know why? Because they have a weak inner man. I call it a weak, a weak spirit. You must develop a strong spirit, man. Your will like your will, like I willfully do something, isn't just something you conjure up. Your will is actually a part of your character. Yes. Yes. And what, what you, we face a lot of times is people don't have a lot of character. And it's these people whose life is filled full of drama. Yeah. Come on. Drama Bahama Mama, you know what I'm talking about. It's wild, wild, wild. And it's over and over and over again. And I'm like, stop. stop. Just stop. stop. Just stop sinning. No, stop. They're like, we're trying. And so, but your will isn't just something that your, your will is actually a part of your character. And so what do you need to do? You have to build up your character yes. in Christ Jesus. Yes. And you do that by being in a relationship with Jesus. Jesus says it like this. You'll be my disciples if you do what? Abide in my words. Abide in my truth. And you will know the truth and the truth shall do what? Make you free. And so what's he talking about? He's talking about the truth shaping and forming you. People that have a weak spirit man or a weak inner man or a weak will, I'm telling you, they usually don't make the right decisions. They usually don't clock in at work on time. These are all things that we're supposed to do as Christians. They have no integrity in their life. They don't keep their word. They're not loyal. They lie. They backbite. That's wrong. I mean, I don't know if anybody's told you that's wrong for that's wrong. It's wrong to be at work and lie to your boss. That's wrong. It's wrong. It's stealing. If you clock back in for lunch and sit back down at the lunch table for 30 more minutes, you're robbing your job. Absolutely. The Lord cannot bless that. And you have a weak inner man, a weak spirit man that needs to be developed. You have a weak will that needs to be developed. But if, if you don't know your purpose and who you are in Christ Jesus, you're just going to be defined by your seasons and you're going to live up and down. You'll be a double-minded man, unstable in how many ways? All of his ways. It'll be a train wreck, man, up and down, up and down. Have you seen people, it's like one, one week they're going to go get a diploma in aerospace engineering, and the next week they're at a hair salon class? I'm like, what is happening? There's no integrity. You're cracked up because it's true. It's, it's because you have a weak will, a weak spirit, man. There's no integrity in your life. Guarantee it, your room's dirty. That's a dishonor to God. That's a weak spirit, man. Come on, if you're going to be a disciple, you know what a disciple is? A disciplined learner. Manifest Jesus in your home. Your main mission field isn't South America. It isn't Europe. It's not Africa. It's your home. You live Jesus 365, 24-7. Never quit, never stop Jesus. It's on. But if you have a weak spirit, man, it won't be on. It'll be off and then on and off and then on. Your kids will be confused. You'll be fighting with your wife after, after church. Your kids are like, why are we even here? You have a weak spirit, man. You need to develop a strong spirit. You only do that by relationship with Jesus and the word of God. That's the only way. You can't grit your teeth hard enough. People that, people that apply external remedies or external fixes to a, a spiritual problem well that'll only work for a minute and then they backslide back into what they was into you ever notice yeah. Yeah. it's a spiritual problem okay I'll, I'll leave you alone I'll put that up <laughs> 
Psalms chapter 1. I'm telling you what, we come hard against abortion. Our church is pro-life, 24. Life is a gift. Life is a gift. And, but abortion is really the fruit of perversion, of sexual perversion in our country. What really needs, what we really need is a revival that changes the morality of our country. Because abortion is just the, the fault of twisted thinking, of morality, of sexual perversion. And we're seeing the fruit of it. And we're trying to cut the, free, the fruit off instead of taking the root out. And if we don't take the root out, we're going to continue to deal with the things like sexual perversion. <coughs> sexual twistedness. This, and that's the truth, man. And, that's, and the only way we're going to begin to see that change. Is first men of God. Be husbands of God. And take their rightful place in their home as king and priest. And lead their kids in truth. And do the right things when nobody's looking. To raise up godly children. That's what's going to change one house at a time. And it begins with the man. And then the woman comes alongside him as a helpmate. And is there alongside of him to strengthen him and help him. And she's there for what he needs to serve one another. And the house is Jesus. Come on, man. And that's where, man, that's, that's what we need. <laughs> Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor, seat, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law or the word. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. Listen to verse 3. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that brings forth its fruit in its season, whose leaf shall not what wither, and whatever he does shall, whatever he does shall prosper. Do you see how to maintain through seasons? He tells us right there. The word of God. The word of God. Listen, where you root yourself is what you reproduce in yourself. Where you root yourself is what you reproduce in yourself. If you root yourself with friends that are bad or with the people at work that are bad or you root yourself in that nasty TV show or you root, or you root yourself in that junk on your phone, that's what you're going to reproduce in yourself. Don't be foolish, oh man. God is not mocked. What a man sows, that he will also reap. If he sows to his spirit, of the spirit, he will reap everlasting life. But if he sows to his flesh, of the flesh, he's going to reap corruption. Because where you root yourself is what you reproduce in yourself. And so if you have to, if you root yourself in your spouse, kids, job, friends, whatever else, none, none of these things or people will produce anything in you. That of worthwhile, worth any life. You can find happiness there for a second. Then it's gone. Then you wither. Listen, I said this once already, but I'll say it again. Seasons do not define us. Jesus defines us. Seasons refine us. Seasons refine us. But if we are not rooted in the word of God, our seasons will define us. Listen, go to John chapter 15. You guys okay with this? This is how Jesus says it. He says it so much better than I ever could. <laughs> John chapter 15, verse 1. Say amen when you're there. Jesus says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word. How do you stay clean in your life? Come on. You are already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Verse 4 says, abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. Get it? Here's another thing I want to talk about seasons. I have a few more points about seasons and I'll be done, okay? Listen, seasons are lengthy. 
One week is not a season. I feel like I've noticed this a lot of times in people's life. Some people will hit a stumbling block and they'll fall down. They'll make a mistake. They'll fall short somewhere. It's a stumbling block. And they'll fall down and all of a sudden they think they're in a dry season. But if you're abiding in the word, guess what you'll never have? A dry season. Right. Come on. Mm -hmm. right. It's not okay to have dry seasons. It's just proof you're not abiding where you're supposed to be. You've rooted yourself somewhere else. And so people fall down, they make a mistake, and they're dealing with shame, condemnation, their conscience is violated, they're working through some of the stuff they've done, and all of a sudden they feel like they're in a, you're not in a dry season. Get yourself up, dust yourself off, abide in Jesus, let the Holy Spirit remind you who you are in Christ Jesus, yes. and keep running well, kiddo. Yes. That simple. Yes. It's that simple. Yes. You're not in a dry season, because if you continue to tell yourself you're in a dry season, you're going to wake up every day. Is it still dusty up there, Lord? It ain't dusty up there. Are my prayers reaching the ceiling, Lord? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Come on. I'm trying to be as nice as I can, but I'm, I'm like this close to not. Listen, seasons are lengthy. One week is not a season. Don't, don't mistake stumbling blocks for seasons. But listen to this. Truth removes stumbling blocks. Yes. Truth removes stumbling blocks. What's been the theme? Abide in the word. The word is the truth. As you know the truth, those things that make you stumble are going to get removed. Yes. Right? Here's what I've noticed in your life. See, a stumbling block can either make you stumble and you'll stay down, or a stumbling block is going to be the thing to make you go up higher next. Yes. Listen, every time you're convicted... Through the truth of the word of God, you have two options. You're either going to go back and live in shame and condemnation, or you're going to go up. When you're truly convicted by the word, that's why they crucified Jesus. You could either accept him or reject him and kill him. And they chose to kill him. And that's the same with truth. When you're faced with conviction and truth comes, and it begins to challenge those stumbling blocks and the things in your heart and in your life, you have two options. Jump in or jump out. I hope you jump in. Yes. <laughs> you said yes. <laughs> Go to Genesis chapter 22. I'm, gonna, I'm almost done here. I'll be done right here. I'm just talking to you about this. Is this helping anybody? Yes. Find your assignment in this season. Your assignment may be opening the door here at church. You know, we have no official really door greeter at our church. It may be, did you know Pastor Donnie, he would never say this. Did you know Pastor Donnie gets up early every morning, walks over to the communication center and makes a pot of coffee? Come on, let's not quiet, I got. There's, if you were to really study how the church is supposed to function and be built on the rock bed of the apostles and the prophets, the foundation of it, that's what the Bible says, it's built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, the churches. And see, when people begin to take away the fivefold ministry, apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, what they're actually doing is they're robbing the foundation of the church. And it's impossible to build a solid house without a solid foundation. And the, and the purpose of apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist, like Pastor Donnie, is to edify you. That means build you up so you can go out and make a difference in the world and make disciples. You know, that's, that's actually how it's supposed to go. We edify you and you go out and shake the nations. That's the ministry of the apostle, prophet, pastor, evangelist. But as soon as we stop doing what we're supposed to be doing because we're doing what you're supposed to be doing, we cripple the body of Christ. And we don't mind doing it. I'm telling you, I'll sit on the mower and smile like I do. I don't care. But for your sakes and for the world's sake, we have to know your place. You have to know your assignment. You okay with that? Am I right, Brother Eric, or wrong? You're right. Okay. <clears throat> I asked him because I knew if I was wrong, he'd tell me. Yeah. <laughs> it's immediately, immediately it cripples the body of Christ. I'll give you an example in the Bible, in the book of Acts, because people are looking at me with their head kind of cockeyed. 
There's a, there's, there's a part in the book of Acts where, so what, how they lived in the book of Acts, because of the time they was living in oppression, the Roman Empire is ruling over them. So when people got saved, they would sell all their stuff, come and lay it down at the apostles' feet. And so as the body of Christ began to grow and grow and grow in the beginning in the book of Acts, it actually got so big that when people needed something, they'd go out every day and give people what they needed. Here's, here's breakfast, here's lunch, here's dinner, however they did it. But there was a group of people that got neglected in the daily distribution. Yeah? And so then what happened is these people came and they complained to the 12 apostles. And you know what their answer was? Are we to take away from prayer and the word of God and go and serve tables? Or should we not rather assign 12 deacons? It's what they were called. The deacons were never made to rule over the pastor. They were made to serve the people. And so should we not assign rather 12 men to go and serve the people so that we can continue in the word of prayer so we can continue to edify you and you can go make disciples? See how important it is for you to know your assignment. Yeah. But you'll never know your assignment or your season if you're selfish. Yeah. You'll never look past yourself to look to serve. It, you have to lay your life down to serve. Yes. That's why Jesus says, I did not come to be served, but to serve. and to do what? Yeah. To lay down my life as a ransom for many. Yeah. Because serving does what? Makes you lay down yeah. your life. And so if you're selfish, you'll never know your assignment, never be under the divine flow of power to fulfill what he's calling you to do. You'll only ever stand off to the side and dream about being used by God, but never lay your life down enough to really be used by God. Genesis chapter 22. Let's go up and read verse one. What time is it? Is it really? <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Papa. If you get done before I do, I, I promise I understand. I'm actually going to read all of this to verse 20. And so, I'm not sorry. Genesis, I'm going to actually read. Okay, okay, back up one verse. Go to Genesis chapter 21, verse 34. And it says, And Abraham stayed in the land of the Philistines many days. Everybody say, Many, many. days. Say it again, many, many days. So let me back up and just explain to you in a real quick nutshell of where we're at in the Bible. When Abraham and Sarah, Abraham was six, 75 years old, he gets a promise from God that they're going to have a son and his name will be Isaac. Sarah is 65 years old. Sarah cracks up and laughs at God, which I wouldn't have done. And so anyway, God's like, why is she laughing? And Abraham's like, I don't know, man. You have to ask her. Sarah's like, I wasn't laughing. He's like, you were. And so anyway, Abraham 75, or Abraham 75, Sarah 65, they wait 25 years to get their promised son. And so through this whole story, um, Sarah gets tired of waiting and says, you know what, Abraham, uh, man, I think God has maybe just kind of forgot his promise. Don't really know what the problem is. Hey, I have this maidservant that helped us out a lot. She knows how things work here. And uh, would you just go in turn? She'll have the son for us. Abraham's like, that's a great idea. And so it's like, Abraham, you idiot. So then Abraham does it. And then you get Ishmael. So now you have Ishmael. And so right before this, so then, so right before we get here, Sarah actually makes Ishmael leave. Because Ishmael was making fun of Isaac. Sarah says, no, nah, I ain't doing this. This is my promise boy. Isaac's my promise son. This son was conceived by works, but this son was conceived by promise. This son was conceived by faith. This son was conceived because of my unbelief. And I will not have unbelief dwell with belief. I will not have what was given by works be dwell with what was given by faith. So then he makes Ishmael leave. And we become products of this promised son. So anyway, we get pretty much this place. So they have the promised baby. Abraham's 100 years old. Sarah's like 85 or something. Man, they're old. It's 90. I guess she'd be 90. So they have this baby. <laughs> And so then they grow up Isaac, but they never move. They stayed in the same place. We just read for many days. Never get stuck in your season. Never get stuck in your season. Because here's what happens next. I believe God told Abraham to do this because Abraham stopped moving. Because you know what you do when you're comfortable? You get complacent. And you know, what, you know what God does when you're comfortable and complacent? He's about to change your season. He does. 
And so now, that, so now Abraham's comfortable and complacent. So now let's see what God's about to do to comfortable, complacent Abraham. It says, now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And Abraham said, here I am. Then he said, take now your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son. And he split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, oh, there it is again. Come on, he's taking the promised son to sacrifice on the third day. Come on, do you think God did that by accident? Yeah. Come on. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The lad and I will go yonder and worship. And listen to what he says. And we will come back. And we will come back. How did Abraham know? Listen, I'm telling you. Abraham said this in Genesis Chapter 22, and I'm going to try to explain this the best that I can, but I, I, I struggle with words sometimes, and I struggle with words with this. But I understand it in my heart and my mind. Holy Spirit, please help me. As faith grows in God, you begin to understand the nature of God. When you understand the nature of God, faith begins to grow in God. And so as Abraham had faith in God, he began to understand the nature of God and understood that God is not going to kill my son, but he's going to raise one up. And he's seen it then because of his faith in God. Does that make sense? Listen, as you know God, faith is the automatic response. Yes. And so as Abraham knew God, had faith in God, he knew the heart of God. He says, no, God told me to kill my boy. But even if I kill him, the Bible says in Hebrews, Abraham believed that God was able to raise him up. And he did in a, in a foreshadow sense of raising up Jesus. You with me? So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, like Jesus carrying the wood, the cross. Come on, you guys see this? And he took the fire in his hand and the knife and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. Then he said, look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Can you imagine? I kind of chuckled when I read that today. It's not really funny. But just, just picture yourself a place. You're carrying the wood. You're with an old man. He's got the knife. You've got the fire. Everything's ready. And you're like, okay, something isn't adding up here. Yeah. Yeah. Abraham's like, it's you, man. Yeah. <laughs> Verse 8 says, and Abraham said, my son, listen to what he says. Because what I was talking about, he knows the nature of God because he has faith. My son, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, here I am. I started to think Abraham was blind because that's how he answered everybody. Like, here I am. I'm sorry. Okay. Verse 12, it says, and he said, capital H, God said, do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now, I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked and there behind him was a ram caught in the thickest, which is a, a male sheep, which is a foreshadow of who? Jesus, come on. A ram caught in a thicket by its horn. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. Verse 15 says, then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, this is the part I want us to really catch here because this is. This is the importance of knowing your season, knowing your assignment. Listen to what happened to Abraham. He says, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because he could swear by no one greater. The Bible later says in Romans, by myself, I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, blessing. 
I will bless you and multiplying. I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemy. He's talking about you. Amen. Let me read this like this. The Lord will bless you and multiply you, multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven and the sand which is on the seashore and your descendants. That's us shall possess the gate of our enemy. In your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men and they arose and went to Beersheba and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. See, you must not get stuck in your seasons. See, don't think your season is small. See, Abraham was thinking son. God was thinking sons. And so whatever season you're in, you may think little. God is thinking big. My wife, I'm going to use her. She's the perfect example. My wife doesn't do, she does a lot of things, but a lot of things that nobody sees because she takes care of her needy pastoral husband and three babies. And so she knows that's her season. She'll tell you that's my assignment to take care of her husband and her babies. And so that's, she's accepted that, received that. Because sometimes the season you're in, you may not like. Abraham probably didn't like the assignment that was given for him in that season. Because some seasons, the assignments you've got, you may not like. Yeah. You may not like it when the Lord tells you, hey, you've been doing everything to chase this prodigal son. Giving him everything. Every time he comes to the door, you're there. But you're enabling him. Why don't you let him in my hands for a minute? And I'm going to deal with him. Then you're in a season, in an assignment to pray and intercede for your boy. Now at a distance, that's hard. Yes. See, but we're thinking son and God's thinking sons. God's saying, I'm going to deliver that boy, and then I'm going to go and use him to reach the nations. And what the enemy has intended for evil, he's going to turn for good. Because yes. Yes. Yeah. we don't see what he sees. We don't think how he thinks. We need to. We need to. But so when he tells you your assignment, you may not like it. And so my wife knows this is her assignment. This is what she's called to do. Take care of my needy pastoral husband and three babies. And so, but then all of a sudden, I get a knock on my door one day. And I open up, and Neil's there. And then Neil never left. <laughs> and so now she takes care of her needy pastor husband and four kids. Yes. And now but suddenly, I, sometimes I go in my house and there's like eight teenagers there. And my wife's there taking care of me, the needy pastor husband, the three kids, and the eight teenagers. And the whole time she's pouring herself into them, serving them. Because all of a sudden, we, she was thinking, this is my assignment right now. It's just my three babies and my husband. And God says, girl, you're thinking too small. Yes. Yes. Never think small yes. about your assignment yes. and your season. So Never think small about it. Don't get stuck in it. Yes. Don't get stuck in your season. Because you won't like how the Lord brings you out of it. Yes. It won't. You won't dig it. I'm almost done. I want to leave you with this. Your current season doesn't define your story. But you're living here. What you're living here or not, Amos? This doesn't define your story. It's not who you are. It's not defining your story. But there's a temptation to let it. Yes. There's things that people have walked in seasons ago that they are still carrying, and they bring up in every fight. They bring up in every circumstance. There's there's notions. There's tendencies that people have grabbed and hold on to because of something that happened to them in previous seasons ago. They still hold on to it. They're still trying to carry it into this next season. And you can't carry something dead into something that's new. That's right. That's right. There's things you have to leave behind you. Sometimes that's hard. Yes. I'm not saying that's easy. That's hard. You have to do that with truth. That's a stumbling block that has to be removed with the truth of the word of God. Yes. And this is the last thing. I want to tell you, and it's just a challenge. And I really felt this word today. Get your calling out of the closet. Get your calling out of the closet. If you feel like God is telling you to do something, and you feel like you can't do it here, I encourage you to do two things. Come talk to me. And if I can't help you do what God's telling you to do, if Pastor Donnie, Pastor Laura, we cannot help you do what God's telling you to do, go somewhere else and do what God's telling you to do. Because this is about the kingdom. Yes. This is about yes. the kingdom. And if anything is keeping you from your assignment, I'm telling you, that is, the, that is why we have a family. It's so we can build each other up so that we can watch each other run well. 
But instead, we're scared to go to let people go to other churches and do other things because, you know, they might like it better there. So then we, we stand off to the sideline and tear each other down instead of build each other up because we're, we're standing over here thinking that they might do it better. Yeah. Come on. Come on. That's, yeah. It's crazy, man. It's crazy. crazy. Yeah. That tells me we're looking at ourselves yes. and not at Jesus. Yes. It's about Jesus. Yes. And it's all about Jesus. And that's how you find your assignment. That's how you know your season. And that's how you figure out who you are, is by looking at Jesus. And you make it through your season. I'm just going to refresh real quick. You make it through your season by knowing your purpose, being founded in the word of God. That's how you make it through, without looking like a circus clown. Mm -hmm. Some of you need to take off the little... Wonk, 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 wonk. Done. Yeah. Done. <laughs> Got those shoes on. Take them off. Come on, come on. Take them off. Take them off. Done. Would you guys stand with me? Do you guys still love me? Yes. I would I would challenge you to message somebody to know your season. And I'm telling you, I'm, I'm preaching this from experience. This isn't a word I heard Stephen Furtick preach. This is something I've walked through. There was a time in my life. Can I just be? Can I be so transparent, honest? Yes. I haven't. I've never said this. This is crazy. Holy Ghost, is this okay? I just want you to know where this word came from in my life. So about nine, ten months ago, probably more than that, year now, I was going to leave here to go start my own ministry. I had a name. I was beginning to write my own bylaws. It's not quiet to God. And I was going to go do my own thing. And that's the tactic of the enemy. Sometimes it's not, you're bad, you're never good enough. Sometimes it's like, I have something better than where you're at right now, but that's not the assignment God has you in. That's right. Come on. Sometimes he might make something try to look a little bit better. God has you in this job right now because he has an assignment and a grace on your life to maybe reach your boss. And so then all of a sudden the Lord puts you in this position, but then he begins to entice you with something else. And all of a sudden you're like, man, maybe that's a little bit better. And you step out of God's divine favor for your life for that season. It's a tactic. I mean, I was about to do that. I was starting to write my bylaws. I had a logo. I think I showed messages and called it the healing rooms. And then all of a sudden I came to find out there's like a hundred different ministries called the healing rooms. I'm like, man, God, you're so good to me. <laughs> and I even, I had a dream one night and I just feel, I just feel so, just so prompted to share this with you. I had a dream one night. I was driving, I was driving our river of faith church bus and I was just driving this thing, driving down 90 highway. And I've always wanted to see a black bear. <laughs> me too. I have just in the woods. Like the rock poppers, I was like, no. <laughs> Listen, you want to know what bears represent in your Bible? Destroyers of destiny. Yes. Lions intimidate and take territory, but bears destroy destiny. When David says, I've killed the lion, I've killed anything that's tried to transgress into my territory, and I've killed the bear, I've killed the thing that tried to take my destiny. And I was driving, I seen a baby black bear in the woods. And I was like, in my little van, I'm driving in my dream, I'm like, there's a baby black bear. Wow, by myself. Which I would have been, if you know what I'm saying. If I would have done what I was going to do, that's how I would have been. I would have been by myself. I'm so thankful for Jesus. And I was driving, and I seen a baby black bear. And I was like, whoa. I drove a little bit farther, went a little bit farther down 90 Highway, and I seen, like, the big daddy black bear standing on the side of the road. And that's what I did, Marsha, in my dream. Oh, that's a, not all of a sudden, I wasn't so excited. Yeah. I was like, that's, that's, a, that's a lot of animal yeah. right there with big claws. Drove a little bit farther in my little van, and all of a sudden, the big mama black bear is standing in the road. That's what I said. And so I try to swerve around it, and I'm about to drive off the road, which is what I was about to do with my life. Mm -hmm. You with me? The yes. Lord gave me a prophetic dream. There you go. And I about swerved off the road. I was swerving off the road. I'm sliding through the gravel, and this bear grabs onto the van and is shredding this van. And it climbs into the cab of the van with me, and it's trying to bite my face. And it's snapping, and it's slobbering, and it's mad. And which is crazy because of how we're living life. Now listen to how all this connects. This bear's about to grab my face in my dream. And I'm standing on the runner board driving the van like this. <laughs> but the door opens to my back. That's how I'm driving the van. And I'm like, this is crazy. And so I, but I get tired of the bear. 
Sometimes you have to get tired of the thing that's destroying your destiny. Absolutely. And I reach up and I grab it by the nap of its neck. I said, you uncircumcised Philistine. Boom. And I threw it out of the van. And blood and guts and fur was flipping out down the road like this. It's flipping head over tail. I drove back in my little beat up Betty White church van. And I'm driving it. And I was like, yeah. Take that bear. You would have been. You didn't see what I saw. I get to the high school at Washburn. Man, I'm trying to get emotional. So I see these kids sitting over here. When I get to the high school, and there was about five or six youth kids sitting there. And they all stood up and they said, we've been waiting for you. And I said, I know, but I'm here now. And all of a sudden, this now is happening in our life. But if I would have let the enemy talk me out of my season and out of my assignment, the fruit that would have been lost, I would have stepped out of God's grace that he had for me in that season, in that place. And that's where the Lord gave me this word. I didn't get this word by sitting at my desk. I have lived what I'm preaching to you. Walked through it. That's why there's authority behind it. Yes. That's why I can say what I say. Because I've walked, I've walked through it. You guys with me? Let's pray. Father, we love you. God, I just thank you right now, Lord. I just pray right now, Lord. You begin to reveal to hearts right now. You begin to reveal to minds in the spirit of wisdom what you have for them in this season. What is their assignment in this season? Who you'd have them to minister to. Who you'd have them to pray home. Who you'd have them to go talk to. How you would have them to serve. God, I just pray you would open up their hearts for revelation, Lord. That you'd speak to them, Lord. That in this season, what you're teaching them. What you're showing them, Lord God. How you're building them up and edifying them, Jesus. I thank you, Father. That, Jesus, you never leave us nor forsake us. And you're with us to the very end, Jesus. And I just thank you, Father, for it. I thank you for your presence, Lord. And I thank you for your love for us in us and through us, God. I ask you to have your way, have your way in this, Lord. We love you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. You guys are dismissed. I would just like to say, if, please, if you're able to, to help in the warehouse, if there's folks out there, um, to, to help grab a box. Amen. Amen. I love you guys.